Howdy folks, Jamboriki here. Blue Sky Studios sadly shut down last year. While not all of their animated movies were great, they did make some pretty good films now and again. In this video, I'm going to be ranking every single Blue Sky villain. Only the major villains though. I won't be including any minions or sidekicks. I hope you're ready. Let's go. The Dino Birds from Ice Age Collision Course In the fifth Ice Age movie, Buckwild explains that a giant asteroid is set to collide with Earth, so Manny's herd must head to the asteroid's destination to deter it. However, a family of egg-stealing bird dinosaurs, led by Father Gavin, want the comet to crash, so that the mammals will all die out and they can fly back safely. Now, as you can tell, Gavin's plan is really stupid. Yes, the movie points out how dumb it is. See, while you run for your mammal lives, we'll be high in the sky, cruising above it all. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But that awareness doesn't change the fact that it's still a rubbish idea. This guy is meant to be our main villain, yet he's completely unthreatening thanks to his lack of thinking skills. Our heroes at least come up with ideas to stop the comet along their adventure, but the dino birds seem totally aimless. They have no backup plans, no strategy, and no epiphanies. Gavin doesn't even take his plan all that seriously, because he keeps getting distracted by his vendetta against Buck Wild, who has a history of stopping dino birds from stealing eggs. I don't think we even need these characters to be the villains, because the asteroid is enough. The world potentially ending is already a conflict for our heroes. Towards the end of the film, Gavin has a redemption and decides to save the planet for his family. But this sentiment is hollow when Gavin has been such a bad father throughout the film. I can't believe he pulled it off. Way to go, dum-dum. Oh, thanks, Dad. I had no hesitation putting these villains right at the very bottom of my list. They're not just the worst Ice Age villains, they're the worst Blue Sky villains altogether. Big Boss from Rio 2 This villain is the head honcho of a logging company who plans to cut down the trees of the Amazon, which is the home to a hidden flock of blue macaws, including Jules' long-lost family. Big Boss is one boring baddie, a bland, one-dimensional straw man for the film's environmental message. Sure, he serves his purpose as an antagonist, which is to be a danger to the rainforest and stop anyone in his way, but I can't exactly praise the bare minimum. The film gives him a lollipop to suck on in every scene, for some reason. It's a character quirk for the sake of a character quirk that doesn't make him more interesting. Yeah, it's hinted that his company was responsible for Joel being torn from a family many years ago. How, 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 how is this? When the loggers came, the, there was fire and, and so much smoke and... and, and I, I had you under my wing and, and then you were... Gone. But the movie doesn't do anything personal with that fact. It doesn't help that he's in a film with seven or eight plots, so he ends up being lost in the many, many different things happening, including the return of another villain. I'm sorry, but I'm really scraping the barrel to find something to analyze about this villain, because he's the very definition of creatively bankrupt. Marcel from Rio. Marcel is the leader of a band of birdnappers who wants to sell valuable macaws blue and jewel. Now, I can't exactly call Marcel particularly compelling, because he's just your typical generic poacher villain that you see in every talking animal movie. Heck, there's not much I can really say about him. And it doesn't help that he's overshadowed by a far more charismatic villain in Rio. However, there's some comedic merit to the dynamic between the no-nonsense Marcel and his dim-witted childish goons. We'll get them back. I have a plan. Oh, great. What are you gonna do? Wander the city calling here, birdie birdie, here birdie. Well, anything sounds dumb when you say it like that. He has a lot of control and confidence in himself as well. Not only does he know how to manipulate a poverty-stricken child into doing his dirty work, Well, what do you know? Good work, Fernando. You see, boys? What did I tell you about this one? But he's also the only human completely unafraid of Nigel, a deranged cockatoo who frightens most people. <laughs> yes! Well done, Nigel. All in all, Marcel is one of the less interesting Blue Sky villains to me, but he has enough redeeming qualities to save him from being ranked lower. The Red Baron from the Peanuts movie. In the Peanuts movie, there's a running plot centered on Snoopy writing a story about himself, in which he meets a pretty poodle called Fifi and has to save her from the villainous Red Baron. I actually wasn't sure whether to include this villain, but I held a poll for my fans to determine if he counts, and the majority said a collective yes. 
What makes the Baron so unique is how everything about his personality is illustrated entirely through his plane's animation. Everything we learn about him comes from the way he flies. He's ruthless, aggressive, tactical and imposing. Things are also made personal by how the Baron has captured Snoopy's love interest. So Snoopy isn't just trying to prove himself as a pilot, he's also on a mission to save his crush. You may be wondering why he's all the way down at number 13. Well, in the grand scheme of the movie's main plot, the Red Baron isn't a real legitimate threat. Sure, the film does a fantastic job investing us in Snoopy's fictional wartime romance adventure story, but the Baron is purely a figment of Snoopy's imagination. Life goes back to normal once the Beagle stops writing. The Red Baron isn't a badly written villain or anything, he's just very outmatched when ranked next to characters who have genuine impacts on their respective films. Unless Snoopy was given a real-life bully, and writing the Red Baron story gave him confidence to stand up for himself? Rudy from Ice Age Dawn of the Dinosaurs Rudy is a legendary dinosaur that serves as a rival to the eccentric Buck Wild. The film does a great job hyping him up as this huge beast that Buck often tangled with, all through a very cinematic and theatrical flashback that paints Rudy as this kaiju-sized prehistoric monster, there's also something very personal to Buck and Rudy's nemesis relationship. Because Rudy was the one who blinded Buck in one eye, and Buck turned one of Rudy's teeth into his trademark weapon. I'll admit that his big reveal doesn't really line up with what was teased earlier, but Rudy is still an intimidating villain, with his pale skin, red eyes, and vicious jaws. Plus, he makes for a difficult foe for our heroes to defeat. <laughs> The problem is that Rudy is less of a major character and more of a final boss who turns up at the film's end. It's hard to rank him higher when he doesn't exactly live up to his myth and doesn't become a serious on-screen presence until the credits are around the corner. Soto from Ice Age Soto is a saber-toothed tiger who orders his pack to kidnap and eat a human baby in revenge for what the humans have done to tigers. One saber, Diego, tries to trick Manny the Mammoth and Sid the Sloth into bringing a baby to his pack. Diego ends up bonding with this new herd and betrays the tigers. While we can empathise with Soto's frustrations against the humans for killing half his pack and using their skin for warmth, you can tell that Soto's vendetta is more about his own personal pride than righteous fairness. What are you doing? Leave the Mammoth. Fine. I'll take you down first. At the end of the day, Soto could have focused more on developing his pack's survival skills and working more as a team to avoid human hunters. Instead, Soto is trying to turn his head into more of a militia than a family, going as far as keeping his fellow tigers in line with abuse and threats. I want that baby, Diego! I'll get it! You'd better, unless you want to serve yourself as a replacement. We'll go up to half peak. Contrast this against Manny and Sid who welcome Diego into their quirky little family, prioritising protecting each other in the wild and keeping the peace. In a film about sticking together with your herd, Soto serves as a perfect reverse to the movie sentiments. What are you two doing here? Soto's getting tired of waiting. Yeah, yeah, he said come back with the baby, or don't come back at all! He also has the most gruesome villain death in Blue Sky history, showing that the studio was sometimes willing to off their baddies in shocking ways. I'd put him higher on the list, but when you really boil Soto down, he's just a bigger and meaner version of Diego. Sure, he totally fits thematically into the first Ice Age movie, and he's a very fierce predator, but I can't exactly say that he stands out in the Blue Sky Rogues gallery. Sour Kangaroo from Horton Hears a Who In the jungle of Newell, Horton the Elephant finds a little world and a speck on a clover. Local nag, Sour Kangaroo, becomes concerned how it will affect her community, so she convinces Vlad the Vulture to destroy the clover. Sour Kangaroo is someone you'd see in the real world, a parent who claims to care about kids, but actually just uses children as a tool to push an agenda or get their way. Are we going to let troublemakers like Horton poison the minds of our children? <laughs> Not the children! She's this bitter and grumpy woman who both shames Horton for his faith in the speck and expresses disgust at the very idea of tiny creatures. She sensationalises Horton's love for the speck as this dangerous to society, when really it's harmless and inspires kids to be creative. We've all got our own clovers with worlds on them! Yeah! Oh. <laughs> 
In my world, everyone's a pony, and they all eat rainbows and poop butterflies. We feel sorry for her son Rudy too, because Sour controls and silences her Joey every day. Not only that, she's even willing to consider trading him for the services of an assassin. I will only do this for a price, in exchange for a brand new pair of... No. This... <laughs> little kangaroo. Mom! Quiet, Rudy. Mommy's thinking it over. While we as an audience do see her as a joke, unfortunately, people like Sour do sometimes get what they want, all through the power of manipulation. I mean, she uses cunning alone to psychologically trip Vlad the Falter into eliminating the Clover for free. Well, thanks, but on second thought, I think I'm going to have the Wickersham brothers take care of this for me. Yeah, of course, Wickersham. I mean, they, they're a classy operation. They, you know, they do. Wait, no! You can't go with Wickersham! No, no, no! The Wickershams would be perfect for this job. But they're monkeys! Sour Kangaroo also manages to scare everyone into downright hating this clover, to the point where she manages to gather an entire mob ready to destroy the clover, so she has the whole of Newell under her thumb by the film's climax. However, this is a film that's been accused of dragging its runtime along, resulting in characters doing pointless filler or talking non stop. Sour Kangaroo is no stranger to this movie floor, because she too spends a lot of the film rambling and ranting. It becomes Tyson to hear the same two or three arguments like a broken record? If you can't see, hear, or feel something, it doesn't exist. And believing in tiny imaginary people is just not something we do. Or tolerate. The film also tries to give her a redemption arc. You see, in the finale, she realizes that the creatures really do exist in this bank. She goes into panic mode at first, but is then eager to start protecting the clover. Here's the thing though, I thought this villain turnaround was a bit too rushed, plus I found it pretty hard to completely forgive a villain who almost sold her child and didn't mind putting Horton's life in danger for her anti-spec agenda. Vlad from Horton Hears a Who. This is a really seedy character who can only be found outside the jungle, in a dark dank lair where prey become feasts. He has this cool Dracula style animation to the way he gestures his wings, and he's so unhealthy that his feathers are falling out. It's one hell of a way to introduce a wretched assassin for hire. It's Horton. He's become obsessed with a clover, and he actually thinks there are little people on it. <laughs> I want that clover destroyed. Sure, what a big deal this is. For you, bro. The fact he's willing to trade his services for Sour Kangaroo's Joey is extra creepy, because he sees this child as a possible fresh dinner. Ugh. But what's funny is that even though he acts all mysterious and dark, he's actually quite insecure and clumsy. He's so desperate to keep up his reputation that he agrees to eliminate the flower for free. When Vlad goes after Horton, he has the advantage of being an agile flying creature, racing after the heavy and slow Horton. Now you're going to get it! Get ready for the best! Uh, 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 leave me alone! Plus, Vlad expresses constant glee and joy from making Horton cower and run. This becomes his downfall, because he enjoys frightening Horton so much that he disposes the clover in a way that's more designed to stress out Horton than to completely destroy the clover. Vlad is a fun guest villain who steals the show as this mad, cruel vulture with an easily bruised ego and a weakness for tormenting animals. Ratchet from Robots. After the jolly and caring Big World retires from Big World Industries, he's replaced by the young and shiny Ratchet, who decides to stop selling outmoded robot parts so that everyone will buy his fancy new upgrades. Meanwhile, a working class inventor called Rodney is giving free repairs to broken robots. Ratchet is a greedy corporate elite with no values or compassion. He's an arrogant and shallow upper class robot with no concern for the struggles of those in poverty. While I will admit that his snobby dialogue can be a bit on the nose. Now, if we're telling robots that no matter what they're made of, they're fine, how can we expect them to feel crummy enough about themselves to buy our upgrades and make themselves look better? We all know CEOs and wealthy elites who share his attitude. Rich jerks who have let power, beauty, and privilege consume their morals. His philosophy of replacing the new with the old can be applied to so many things, not just robot parts, because society is always evolving and changing, while the less fortunate can't keep up. Take a look at the new Big Weld Spring Collection. Ooh. I 
can't afford that fancy stuff. All I need is one stinking neck joint. Big Walt uses his position to inspire, motivate, and spread hope, but Ratchet just sees being CEO as an opportunity for cash cow success. What a remarkable legacy. Concern for the common robot. You don't come across old-fashioned values like that anymore, friends. And for good reason. There's no money in it! What I found most interesting about Ratchet, though, is that behind all of his arrogance and smugness is a scared little mummy's boy. For someone who thinks that he has everything, he still has the maturity and dependence of a child. I think that's what makes him more than just your average greedy businessman trope. We've got to find out who this is and stop him. Not stop him, crush him. El Primero from Ferdinand. El Primero is a celebrity matador who comes to Casa del Toro to pick a bull for an upcoming fight, and he ends up choosing Ferdinand the Pacifist, a choice he later regrets when Ferdinand refuses to battle in the arena. El Primero is a villain who is 100% aware of his fame and success. He owns his luxury and reputation. It's this confidence that helps him to get whatever he wants, and put pressure on being given the best of the best. My final fight is in two days. If I do not find the best bull for the best bullfighter by then, no bullfighter will ever use your ranch again. He also very much symbolizes the very thing that Ferdinand resents, senseless violence, making him the perfect antagonist to our pacifist bull. <laughs> Even though he's the star of a very cruel and outdated form of entertainment, he takes what he does very seriously. He doesn't just see his career as an easy path to wealth and celebrity. El Pereira respects the legacy of this sport and puts his heart into the craft. What an honor to have you here at my humble home. Es un honor. I do not shake. My hands are my instruments, as are my arms, legs, chest, feet, and buttocks. Comprende? His confrontation with Ferdinand results in public humiliation, but also a moment of mercy from the animal he's tortured all his life. When the crowd demands that Ferdinand lives, El Primero doesn't kick up a fuss or ignore the chance. He keeps his dignity by listening to the audience. While there are better Blue Sky villains out there, I'm impressed the Blue Sky took the chance to add some depth to the baddie in their animal rights activist film. Madame Gasket from Robots Madame Gasket is the new boss of Big Well's robot parts factory a mother of the company's current CEO, Ratchet. I freaking love Gasket's character design. Just look at it. It's grotesque and menacing, but also has all these little steampunk details. And her lizard-like fiery eyes are piercing. Gasket is a horrible boss who works her employees to the grave. Perhaps the worst employee you can imagine. She even treats staff breaks like a joke. All right, break time. Break time's over! Chop chop! <laughs> Heck, she even punished her own husband for getting in her way. Oh, come on, Mom! He's not gonna be any trouble where he what is. What are you afraid of? Grow some bows. Or do you want to end up like your father? Hey, son. Good to see you. Even though Gasket isn't a company-friendly looking woman, according to her handsome son, she's really good at turning the cogs from her sinister underground lair. She knows how to butter up her son to retain control behind the scenes. Not Big Well Industries. Ratchet Industries. Keep talking. Ratchet City! It helps that she's a lot smarter than Ratchet, because she can act as the brains to his brawn in their family takeover. Oh, so what if one crazy fanatic repairs a few outmodes? Who cares? Think. Use those brains I stole for you. Today it's one. What about tomorrow when everybody gets the idea this is okay? We can fix ourselves. We don't need upgrades. We want big wealth. Then what happens to you? Due to her reclusive lifestyle, she doesn't get to interact much with the outside world, so she's often left out of what's happening in the film. But she is given a chance to fight face to face with our heroes in the big showdown finale. <laughs> <laughs> Madame Gasket is a camp, devious, and intelligent diva villain with an imaginative design and a sick-looking lair. Mandrake from Epic. Mandrake is a powerful boggan who could decay nature, 
and he wants to destroy the forest using his powers of death. So he sets out to assassinate the forest queen. In the Boggan's battle against the queen's leafmen though, Mandrake's son Dagda ends up being killed in action. In revenge, Mandrake plans to steal the pod for the queen's heir and grow it in darkness. I used to find Mandrake rather forgettable, but after paying more attention to him for this video, and reading other people's critiques, I've come to better appreciate him. First of all, animated environmentalist movies tend to oversimplify man-made pollution into some kind of scented monster, which just dumbs down a serious world issue. But Mandrake isn't supposed to represent pollution. He's a symbol of wildlife decay, an inherent part of nature. What makes him bad is that he's creating an imbalance in the forest by forcing decay to take over plants and trees. While this does make him evil, he's not causing said destruction for shallow power, but because he wants to be a good leader to his fellow Boggins, by making the world a better place for his people. The Leafmen think they can keep us contained, surround our beautiful island of rot with their hideous green forest. So arrogant! He's also a very doting father who affectionately loves his son, I won't let you down. Dad. I know you won't. You look good in rat. It's slimming. And he becomes genuinely angered by his grief after losing Dagda. You got rid of the queen, but let her pod get away. Plus your idiot general gets himself mulched. <laughs> that idiot general was my son! So yeah, there's some dimension to his character that stops him from being a one-note flat villain. On the other hand though, I have to confess that the film underuses him. He doesn't get to do much besides monologue his plans, rant his revenge, and chase after our heroes. He's a complex and layered character, but I feel like Epic could have done way more with him. Like, developed his rivalry with our heroes into something more than just comedic banter, or invested us in his bog and culture. Cretaceous and Maelstrom from Ice Age The Meltdown. These two villains are species from a different prehistoric age and have been unfrozen during a global meltdown. They're almost like ghosts of a bygone era, resurrected from history to torment animals of the present. Ice Age 2 centers around Manny's worries of his species' possible extinction and internal feelings of letting go of the past. Cretaceous and Maelstrom are physical manifestations of these fears because they're monsters who are defying the natural order and refusing to fade into history. These are also really creepy villains. I mean, they have quite menacing looking designs and never say a single word. They have one motive, kill on sight. Heck, they're hugely advantageous as predators too, because they can breathe on land and underwater. Our heroes are either stuck with them on a tiny space of ice or become easy prey below the surface. Ellie, hold on to me. <laughs> Keep in mind too, these are the only Ice Age villains who commit an on-screen killing? Yikes. Stu! Come on, Stu! Let's blow this ice cube stand! Cretaceous and Maelstrom can be best described as recurring obstacles, but it's kind of awesome seeing kids' movie villains that resemble 80s slasher killers. Silent stalkers with a one-track mind to feast on whatever they see. Captain Gut from Ice Age Continental Drift. When the Earth's continents start drifting apart, Manny ends up splitting from his family. While searching the seas to get home, Manny and friends bump into Captain Gut and his pirate crew. Gut wants Manny to join his pirates, but the mammoth declines, and ends up destroying the captain's ship while escaping. Captain Gut is very similar to Soto from the first Ice Age, a leader of a herd who gets them into villainy and treats them like crap, but I think that Gut has a lot more flavor and texture as a character. For example, his design is a really clever attempt at making a prehistoric ape look like a pirate. All through the way, his fur naturally resembles a captain's hat and a scraggly beard. Only ship has a fantastic look to it too. It's this gothic angular iceberg that launches skulls for anchors. It's sick. Gut also has this smooth talking charm to him that makes him engaging to watch. It's this charisma that helps us to see why these lost souls joined his crew. Ladies first. Such a nice boy. Why can't you be more like him, Sydney? He also has this authentic love for the ocean. He's not just a pirate for the sake of it. He genuinely adores sailing and prefers the sea over the land. We don't want any trouble. 
We just need to get back to the continent. The continent? That pile of rubble? <laughs> <laughs> it's not just a sailor with a knack for singing sea shanties, though. I mean, he got his name from the fact that he can rip his victim's guts out with his bare claws. Oh, and as to be expected from a pirate captain, Gut is a natural sword fighter when pushed into a duel. <laughs> You know, this ocean isn't big enough for the both of us. Not to mention, Gut and Manny have the best hero and villain rivalry in the Ice Age franchise. Gut resents Manny for destroying his ship and turning his right hand tiger against him. So Gut sets out to take away the most precious thing to Manny, his family. It's all very personal. Let them go. <laughs> I don't think so. You destroyed everything I had. I'm just returning the favor. Captain Good really sticks out as a memorable and original Blue Sky villain. I'd go as far as to say that he's the best aspect of Ice Age 4. Nigel from Rio 1 and 2. Nigel is a cockatoo who works for Marcel the Birdnapper and helps his boss get Joel and Blue back after the escape. He's this cackling maniac who is willing to betray his own kind for a life of comfort. It's kind of disturbing how merciless he is when it comes to exploiting his fellow birds. I mean, he's even happy to eat other birds without any remorse. He also comes off as very threatening to both animals and humans. He's quite big for a cockatoo and his face is kind of scary, so he can strike fear into anyone he wants. There are two blue macaws out there, and I need your multitude of eyes to help me find them. Oh yeah? <laughs> What's in it for us? <laughs> well, that's a fair question. <laughs> Let's discuss it. But the best thing about him is how entertainingly flamboyant he is. You see, Nigel used to be a classy stage performer, so he commands himself with a lot of theatricality. There's a campy elegance to him that's captivating to watch. Owen Jermaine Clement provides his voice, someone who excels at playing musical villains. Clement voices Nigel with this oozing evil and demented insanity. Oh, pity. Now we have two useless, flightless birds. Now, yes, he comes back in Rio too, but his character has been downgraded to this pitiful punchline, lacking the same charisma and menace that we saw in the first film. But I don't think that the sequel's mishandling of his character ruins his overall legacy. Some of you may be wondering why Nigel is at number two, when he was the highest ranked villain in my top five Blue Sky characters livestream a while back. Well, opinions can change over time. Killiam from Spies in Disguise. Sterling is a secret agent renowned for taking a violent approach to his job. One day, he's framed as the culprit in a string of crimes. The mastermind behind this framing turns out to be Killian, a criminal who lost all of his friends thanks to an explosion that Sterling started. Now Killian plans to use drone technology to wipe out every secret agent seeing them as a danger to the world. Unfortunately, Sterling has been turned into a pigeon. As a baddie, Killian is intensely intimidating. He has this scowling face full of rage and vengeance, as well as a cold, whispery voice that manages to make the Australian accent sound uncomforting. Do you feel that dread? Oh, can you feel it? Rolling around you like a fog. I told you, I don't even know you, man. But I know you. Think about it. Sterling's explosion instance not only resulted in Killian becoming creepily part cyborg, but also led to Killian installing an advanced robot hand, which he uses to control drones or disguise himself. Despite being a criminal, we do actually understand Killian's point of view. Sterling claims to be out to protect the world, but his impulsive violent methods caused bloodshed and just made Killian into an angry monster. It's okay for a villain to be right about a hero's flaws. It's what makes the storytelling less black and white. You were a bunch of bad dudes about to hurt a lot of innocent people. And it's my job to keep everyone safe. Everyone. I watched every single one of my people die as your agency's weapons rained down on us. While Killian is on his vendetta against secret agents, Sterling gets to see a more pacifist approach to handling criminals through Walter, a science whiz who has found more professional and peaceful detainment methods via his clever gadgets. When Killian is eventually taken down by one of Walter's gadgets, he actually shows this subtle hint of appreciation for Walter's cruelty-free style of policing. 
Killian is a villain that showcases Blue Sky's more complicated character writing skills. A cool, badass, part cyborg antagonist who was right to accuse an authority figure for brutality, but wrong in how he went about solving it. I'm glad that a rewatch of Spies in Disguise helped me to realise what a great villain Killian is. So, those are my rankings. Who's your favourite Blue Sky villain and why? Let everyone know in the comments section below, and don't forget to click that like button. I've been Jambariki, feel free to subscribe, and cheerio folks!